Through my YouTube channel, I'm often asked for the technical information regarding my images, the metadata, and in particular, shutter speeds and apertures. But landscape photography is a lot more than that. When I go on a shoot, I have a clear idea what I want to do from start to finish. Now, start means research before the actual photography, right through to post-production in Lightroom and Photoshop. I have a vast library of ordnance survey maps and guidebooks, some of which I take with me. But in studying these maps, it is helpful to decide what gear to take, or perhaps more importantly, what gear to leave behind. Research is an essential part of my work because much of my photography uh, is taken on long walks. Therefore, I don't wish to weigh myself down with gear that I am unlikely to use. And in fact, I enjoy research and planning my visits. Dare I say, it's half the fun. A landscape has its own choreography, weather which can alter its character completely. The real skill in landscape photography is to arrive with the right sort of weather, the technical side coming as standard. Nevertheless, this is what most photographers want to know, shutter speeds and apertures, which I will attempt to deliver as well as the more important stuff. Therefore, I leave home knowing what I intend to photograph and stick to the plot. This is very important if you already have someone waiting for the photographs. As you are at the mercy of weather, a plan B is important, unless, of course, you are working to contract, and that will require another skill. There are subjects that photograph well in poor light. Gardens, for example, also waterfalls and steam engines. Otherwise, I switch to interiors. This could, of course, affect what gear I take, but through extensive experience, a zoom over the middle range is the ideal instrument that covers 95% of scenarios, and in Olympus terms, that means their highly versatile 12 to 100 Pro lens or the 12 to 200. In situ, I start on program, and that might surprise you. There is nothing wrong with program, but unlike auto, which it is often confused with, you can still add your personal settings, such as white balance and exposure compensation. Furthermore, if your camera has program plus shift, that allows you to adjust shutter speeds and apertures quickly without resorting to the appropriate mode. This can be important when seeking images. A landscape is unlikely to run away, but the light making it look special can. Rainbows, for example. When I have settled on a subject which is not going to run away, only then do I consider using aperture or shutter priority. However, I preset some controls beforehand for general scenarios, provided they can be reversed later should I change my mind. Saving to RAW offers considerable scope for adjustment in post-production. I underexpose everything by minus 0.3 EV to avoid accidental blown out highlights that are difficult to correct in Photoshop. Although not necessary, I do put the white balance on daylight or cloudy according to conditions. With the help of an electronic finder, I spot meter every shot at 200 ISO as I can see what I am doing. With Olympus, half depressing the shutter button will lock exposure and focusing on S-hyphen 
AF, allowing you to move the camera to the intended composition if required. For now, I leave the camera on autofocus and the image stabilizer on. I now offer a couple of examples and explain the thinking behind them in some detail. Skeltscar Kendall Cumbria. The attraction of this image is light. I also liked the path in the lower part of the composition leading the eye into the picture. Everything is at infinity, therefore depth of field is not an issue. The camera is on program, but what it uses is not that critical so long as I can hand hold and the aperture is somewhere in the middle of the range. The chosen focal length of the 12 to 100 Pro lens was 54 mm, that's 108 in film. Therefore, the image stabilizers in camera and lens, not to mention my current state of health, allowed me to handhold quite safely at 250th of a second. I do not play around with saturation or sharpness. That can be done later in post-production. But I spot metered a highlight so that shadows, if required, become easier to correct without causing noise. It was shot at 4 by 3 ratio. This is 16 times 9 for YouTube, which I had in mind on the shoot, but it has been cropped so that the original 4x3 can be used for other applications. I do not lock myself into a single commitment. Lincoln Cathedral, St. Hugh's Choir The technique for this shot could not be more different. It is handheld at a fifth of a second with the same gear as the last shot. Surprised? Well, you shouldn't be. However, I am now using the wide angle end of the same optic, which makes hand holding easier in low light. I was forced to bump the ISO up to 400. Nevertheless, the lens will still default to f4 if the camera mode is on program. This may be an issue for depth of field on other camera formats, but not Micro Four Thirds, which gives more depth of field when required and, of course, essential here. Enter a bit of traditional photographic technique that perhaps we have forgotten, the hyperfocal distance. Whatever the camera focuses on, depth of field extends twice as much behind the subject as in front, so you manually focus about one-third into the view. Allow autofocus to focus on the background, and the foreground will be unsharp, even with micro four-thirds. I was aware of the picture's symmetry, finding, in the end, straight down the middle the best. I spot-metered the organ casing together with the brighter part of the background, and then manually brought the focus point forward. Because of the abundance of different and varied lighting, trying to achieve correct colour balance at the time of photography is a nightmare. I find it easier to wait until post-production and make adjustments to the raw file with the white balance controls in Lightroom. This, incidentally, is much more difficult to do if you save straight to JPEG. You've got to save to RAW to make this fine adjustment to the white balance. This, of course, is only half a story. So now we move to post-production. However, before I start playing around in Lightroom or Photoshop, I catalogue my photographs first. This is easily done in Olympus Viewer, where I can give each image an individual name and number. Now, with this information, I can locate any group of images within 10 seconds from a library of nearly 100,000. The image out of camera looks really flat, doesn't it? 
and underexposed, but that is quite deliberate and planned. As wonderful as photographic technology is, it is not as good as you, the human eye and brain, especially images having a high dynamic range. Technology introduced us to HDR, but I prefer traditional techniques where I have more control. Whilst I am aware of what I say today is out of date by tomorrow, correcting underexposed areas of an image in post-production is still easier than highlights. But of course, nothing can be as easy as that, can it? Noise in underexposure is of course the big evil, and when taking images you find yourself walking a tightrope between noise and blown out highlights, and for that reason saving to raw first makes the job easier in post-production. First, by increasing the exposure in Lightroom, I now whack highlights and whites right down to restore detail. I adjust vibrance and clarity, but be careful with the latter, as artifacts can rear their ugly head in the shape of a hard white line on neighbouring parts of an image of high contrast. These days I tend to keep clarity at plus 20, but bump up the contrast a bit. When complete, I save to JPEG depending on final output, which for YouTube means reducing the pixel count in addition to a crop. The original RAW file is archived along with the sidecar file containing the Lightroom adjustments. Delete the sidecar file and you are back to the original image out of camera. Lincoln Cathedral is a different kettle of fish. The original is grossly underexposed. Because of the variety of lighting within the cathedral, it is easier to tweak white balance manually as opposed to using any of the presets. I increase shadows and blacks. This must be done with care, otherwise noise will appear. A fine balancing act with exposure. When I took this shot, I must have had a heady drink from the Cathedral Café. However, this was easy to correct lower down in the Lightroom panel. You can also adjust wonky pictures in Photoshop. Whilst highlights behind the organ casing could have posed a problem, the dynamic range here is much less than the view behind me. This is a prime example where you need to underexpose so that the great east window is not so overexposed to the point that it cannot be corrected in Lightroom. It was also a very fine balancing act to restore detail back to the choir stalls without noise. These days, whether achieved in camera or post-production, it is now inexcusable to have an overexposed window in a much darker church interior. When I start a shoot, I keep my output options as open as possible. I keep the format at 4 times 3 ratio, save to RAW and then crop to 16 times 9 for YouTube when I can. Publishing in books, magazines and calendars requires images that offer the publisher format flexibility. Therefore, saving to 16 times 9 and indeed any other landscape ratio format restricts their use. I have on a couple of occasions had a 4 times 3 landscape orientated image successfully cropped to portrait for magazine front covers, losing about a third of the image. 16 times 9, even 3 times 2 would make this option more difficult. The perfect ratio is of course square, which I did in my Hasselblad film days, and that worked beautifully. But 4 times 3 with Olympus is near enough. Whenever I take 
a photograph, I have a clear idea what I'm going to do in Lightroom in post-production. Creative photography, certainly in landscape, is not a question of looking up, for example, Rule 29 in the instruction book. As my music teacher said to me, Derek, practice makes perfect. And that applies equally to photography. And by the way, I failed in music because I didn't practice. Landscape photography is a commitment where you have to know and understand your camera and perhaps the traditional aspects of photography. It's no use relying on a fluke. Certainly as a professional, I have to offer my clients a guarantee and not a fluke as to whether it will happen or not.